For nearly 50 years, Roe stood as the law of the land, meaning that women of childbearing age don't even know an America without it until now. In her piece, What My Mom Told Me About America Before Roe, Molly Jong Fast details what a pre-Roe world looked like. She writes, pre-Roe life was hard for women in almost unimaginable ways. One bad decision could alter your life forever. In order to understand what this post-Roe America might look like, we actually need to understand America before Roe. And frankly, that reality is bleak. Joining me now is the author of that piece, contributing writer at The Atlantic and friend, Molly Jong Fast. Molly, how are you? I guess in writing that piece, boy, you know, you, I mean, we knew this, right, Molly? We knew that this was likely going to happen with the Dobbs decision. But in writing that piece, what did you take away about pre-Roe America that's going to actually inform the world that we're now kind of barreling into? Well, Roe was about bodily autonomy, right? It was about the idea that you could control what happened in your own body. You were women were broadly given the power to control their pregnancies, to uh, end a pregnancy, and they were given, a, you know, a kind of uh, autonomy and a kind of freedom that, you know, they had not had. And what happened when that happened in 1973 was it sort of created a, a cascade of other feminist legislation. It was like, well, if these women can end a pregnancy, then maybe they should be able to have a credit card, and maybe they should be able to, uh, you know, not be discriminated against if they are pregnant, or maybe they should be able to not be sexually harassed in the workplace. And it, it, it begot more and more uh, legislation and autonomy and legal autonomy. What happens now is you have a Supreme Court that has said women really don't have the right to make decisions about their own bodies, that um, that's not up to them. That's up to these states, which, I mean, really, the you see already Republicans. By the way, it's fascinating. Republicans already giving away the game, right? Mike Pence calling for a— ban, uh, you know, a ban on abortion. I mean, this is not even going to states' rights. They're not even pretending anymore. They're going right to, like, women shouldn't have the right. So uh, you're going to see more of this. You're going to see women not being trusted, because this is about women's bodies belonging to legislators. You know, Molly, you write in your piece, though, and you just mentioned it briefly just a second ago. Post-Roe, Roe was kind of that turning point for women, and not just for the bodily autonomy concept, which, of course, we fully embrace, it was almost an empowerment, right? It was the idea that once we had that bodily autonomy, women were able to empower themselves to say and to put their foot down for other violations that came to them, either physical or otherwise. So for the children or the generation of people like my daughter, for example, what are we saying to them now that post-Row America is looking like? Because your mom's pre-Row America, right, looked a certain way. But now I guess maybe I should call it Molly post-Dobbs. What is a post-Dobbs America going to look like for these kids? I mean, I think it looks like they'll be blue. Hopefully, I mean, again, we see these Republicans giving away the game. If they win in the midterms, we could have no abortion in America. We could have bans. You know, they could try and ban it everywhere. I mean, I don't think that's hysterical. I think that's very likely. They've already said that's where they want to go with this. Um, you know, we are looking at, a, at an America where women do not have the same rights as men. So when you're pregnant and you go to the doctor and maybe you're having a miscarriage and maybe not, they can't perform a DNC, right? Because abortion is not legal here anymore, right? And you're, they're going to have to be able to prove, I mean, depending on which state it is in, it's going to be a patchwork of insane laws that are going to be wildly different and inconsistent. I mean, the only good thing about this is that it's so bad and it's so, such a huge reversal, taking a right away from women after 49 years, that, and it's going to be so different that you might end up having an, a country that doesn't look like each other, where states like uh, California doesn't belong in the same country as in Alabama. And, you know, you have to ask yourself why, I mean, 
I just don't understand how a woman can have different rights in Alabama than she has in California. Yeah, I mentioned a few episodes ago, it makes no sense. It's like you cross a state line, the border of a state line, and all of a sudden you're different in some way, like your, your autonomy is different. But, but let's talk about uh, the political component of this, because let's be honest, for years, Republicans have been very slowly but methodically moving towards this day. I mean, we saw Marjorie Taylor Greene went to the Supreme Court today to pray over the joy of what happened. The entire time, though, we've all been saying, oh, no, of course, SCOTUS would never overturn Roe. It's set a law. In our defense, though, you had Supreme Court justices during the nomination process that are like, it's stare decisis. It's set a law. We're not going to touch it. Do you think this decision today will shake people, though? Like the complacent ones. Yeah. I mean, yes. at the very least, it's we're going to get something other than Susan Collins. I'm a little concerned. I mean, are we actually going to get people to say, you know what? We got to do something now. Yeah, I think this is it. I mean, I know that I was ready for this, and I can't believe how it feels. Like, I was ready for this. I've written about this. I've written so many pieces about this, and I can't, I cannot believe how it feels. I mean, I just can't. My inbox is filled with people. I mean, I just, it is so unbelievable. And look, I'm a middle-aged woman. I'm not getting an abortion. I mean, it's not about me. It's about the freedom of my fellow women. And it just, it just, I can't. I cannot. I mean, I'm trying to write about it, and I can't even believe how it feels. It just feels like, you know, we knew it was coming, and it just feels like a gut punch. And I think, you know, my inbox is filled with other women saying the same thing. They can't. They can't believe it. And so we knew it was coming, but it it feel. I think it will. I mean, I hope it will, because if not, I don't know what future any of us have in this country. How do you channel that emotion? Molly, how do you channel that combination of disappointment, fear, um, just, uh, just this idea that the world has been turned on its head? How do people channel that? How do you channel that emotion into a productive vein where maybe there is a difference that can be made in November, maybe there's a difference that can be made in 2024? I mean, we have to elect serious legislators and not people who, uh, you know, are we need people who are going to pass laws, who are going to protect women's rights. We need people who are going to fight. We need I, I don't know what that looks like, but we need to elect candidates who really care and don't just necessarily have a letter next to their name. I think we're going to have to redouble our efforts to take care of the other people in this country who are not going to be able to get abortions. And that means giving to uh, abortion funds. And there are a lot of them. There are a lot of activists in this country who are doing the really hard work on abortion. And uh, it's not so hard to find them. They're on Twitter. They exist. And, you know, you give money to those people. You do what you can. You know, I would be writing about this as much as possible. And, and you know, we and we live another day. And there's midterm elections coming up. There's still primaries going. And we need candidates who are going to fight for women's bodily autonomy. And there's no room for people who are just going to get a you know, get elected so that they can have a place to go. You know, this is not, uh, you know, we are, we, we need real leaders who will pass legislation and protect women. Molly, let's talk about the real life implications of what just happened today with Dobbs. You're going to have these inconsistent uh, laws in these different states. You're going to have what I call abortion tourism in some way. The idea yeah. that people who have the means financially to go and get abortions are going to go to states where that's permitted. But for those that are disadvantaged and don't have that, either financially or otherwise, the opportunity to get an abortion, you wrote in your piece, in the past three decades, septic abortion deaths have declined worldwide by about 42 percent. But as the Atlantic's Olga Kazan has noted, unsafe abortions are more common in countries where the practice is illegal. Even now, black women are more than three times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. That's the reality, right, Molly? It's going to be the uh, back alleyway abortions. It's going to be the sneak into somewhere and try to get one and run the risk of death. Is that what this looks like now? Well, I mean, the good news is 50 percent of all abortions are the abortion pills, and they're very safe, and the science is there. And abortions have gotten much, much safer over the last 50 years. So the good news is that 
we may not see the same level of women dying of abortions that we saw 50 years ago. I am i can't believe I even just had to say that, okay? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's where we're at, is like maybe uh, not as many women will die. And uh, But, I mean, it's obviously this is a situation that is just untenable. Um, the good news is there are abortion pills. They can be sent through the mail. There are a lot of smart people working on getting abortion pills to people who need them. For now, California, New York, a bunch of blue states. Uh, Planned Parenthood in California has done a lot of really interesting stuff. They're expanding care. They're making it so there are, you know, there are grants to go and have an abortion. There are people who will drive you. There are a bunch of really good organizations that are working on providing abortion access for the people in the red states. But again, remember, Republicans have their eye on the ball. Right now, we have blue states and red states and different laws in blue states and red states, but eventually we're just going to have these bans and they're going to just go for a row entirely. So I think it's important to realize that this midterm is actually, believe it or not, the most important midterm of our lives. Well, I don't mean to be the harbinger of doom, Molly, but to the point of your last answer, though, there are laws that are getting up in states right now to prosecute people that are trying to help people cross state lines or even within state lines to get abortions. There are laws that are targeting interstate commerce, right, on the idea that you can get these abortion pills across state lines. And so I think, to your point, there has to be some concerted, thoughtful movement of people to the ballot box in November to say enough is enough. We can't literally survive this. Molly Jong-Fast, thank you for being with me today. I really appreciate it.